All right, thanks very much, Sherwin, for uh, organizing this group and uh, letting me present tonight. Tonight, I have the eagerly awaited emotive epoch, which lets you control a computer with your mind. It sounds like science fiction, but it's actually reality. So let's start uh, at the beginning here. BCI. Huh? What's BCI? It's a brain-computer interface. So it is anything that lets you interact with the computer directly with your brain. It's also called a neural interface. Now, there's two types of BCI. One is called invasive, and the other one is called non-invasive. So invasive, I don't know, has anyone seen the movie The Matrix? So everyone knows the concept, you know, you've got a plug that like sticks into the back of your head. That would be an invasive BCI. So it's it's got wires that go directly into your brain. Um, Non-invasive, that's what this is. Non-invasive uses something called EEG to recognize the electrical activity that's at the surface, so that's on your scalp which just happens to be very similar to the electrical activity that's happening deeper in your brain. So you can actually analyze the electrical activity on the surface and extrapolate the electrical activity in deeper areas of your brain. So why, why do I have this thing? Why am I interested in this at all? Like, I'm a web developer, you know, what's the connection? Robocop. Have you ever seen the movie Robocop? <laughs> it came out when I was, I think, about 10 years old. And I remember watching it and thinking to myself, you know what, this is like a crazy future technology, but this is also a technology that I could see sort of coming to fruition in my lifetime. I'm like, you know, it's, it's in the future, but it's not that far in the future. So at that point, I started following BCI and just, you know, finding out, learning anything I could about it. So why us? I hate other input devices. Keyboards are slow. Mice, as Sherwin pointed out, are painful. You know, you, you can, your wrist starts hurting after you use it for more than like an hour. You know, even less sometimes. Voice commands. Uh, a lot of new phone, phones have voice control. And, you know, it's kind of cool, but it's noisy. Like, imagine all of you were trying to take notes on your phone using voice commands, like right now. What would that sound like? It, it's, it's just not practical. So, and the other big thing that I, that I want to see eventually is communication via thought, which it's a bit of a crazy concept. I mean, right now, I'm communicating to you with language and sound. But imagine that we had a connection where I could actually send you a concept, you know, a concept in my mind that was not necessarily linguistic. It was just conceptual. I mean, it would allow you to communicate with people that didn't even speak the same language and transmit ideas instead of words. So again, this is far off in the future, but I look at that and I see, I see, you know, communicating through thought eventually, at some point. BCI history. This technology has been around since the 1970s. Um, it was done through a DARPA grant at UCLA. Um, Interestingly, it was originally designed for fighter pilots because they said, you know what, fighter pilots have to have like really fast reflexes. And we think you know, the best way to do that is to have a direct interface to the mind. So in the 70s, they, you know, they didn't really get that far. They, they didn't have the computing horsepower to actually figure out what all the, what all the EEG stuff meant. So in the 90s, the computing power appeared and they got a lot further. So they started doing a lot of research with animals, one, um, mostly with invasive BCIs in animals. 
uh, monkeys and that kind of thing. Um, and also with disabled people. So um, people that have been paralyzed, that kind of thing, and giving them the ability to communicate um, via the VCI. In the 2000s, uh, there was a really interesting project that actually gave sight to a blind person um, through a form of VCI. Um, I'll send links to this slide. That, that's actually a link to the project. Basically, this person was totally blind, and they put a bionic eye on him, connected directly to the portion of his brain respons responsible for sight. And it was good enough that it allowed him to drive around a parking lot and be able to see where he was going. So, totally insane. Um, also, very recently, within the last couple of years, uh, there's been several devices uh, that are commercial and used for gaming, as well as research. That's where the emotive epoch comes in. That's what I brought tonight. Um, and the primary things that it's used for right now are research and gaming. Research, because it's a fairly low-cost, accurate device. Um, typically, these research devices would have cost in the thousands, you know, up, up to like $15,000. Whereas the research version of the motive uh, only cost $800. So quite a bit cheaper. Um, and of course for gaming, the consumer version, the consumer version is $299. Now, the pros and cons. The pros is that this has 14 electrodes which is almost as many as like a very high-end research uh, EEG device. The big con is the fact that it uses wet technology. So anytime you use it, you have to wet all of the 14 electrodes with saline solution. And after about an hour or two, that dries up and stops working. So that's a real pain. Competitors. There's actually two major competitors to the emotive right now. The first one is the OZTNIA, which stands for Neural Impulse Actuator. It has three electrodes, so not nearly as many as the emotive, um, but it does use dry technology, which makes it a lot easier to put on and take off. There's also the NeuroSky Mindset. Um, that powers the Mindflex, which I think is from Mattel, and also the Star Wars Trainer, which lets you do something where you like pretend you're using force. Um, and it's a fairly low-end device. It has one electrode, but you can still do some pretty cool stuff. So the future. How are these things going to improve? Better EEG resolution. So there's a limit put to what you can do with non-invasive technology, but I think you can still put more electrodes on there and have better resolution, which in theory would lead to better results. The other thing is better EEG algorithms. Right now, the computer programs that interpret the data from the EEG are still evolving. They're not that accurate, and the trouble is it's a very hard problem. Like, you know, the best PhD computer science people have been working on this for decades, and it's still kind of not that great. So there's still a lot more work to be done in terms of the algorithms. Another big thing to watch is what's called FMRI, Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. What that does is, in real time, measures the magnetic fields in your brain which correlate 100% to the electrical activity. And it can actually monitor that in three dimensions. The only slight drawback is that it currently costs two to three million dollars for the hardware. And if you want to use it, you actually have to be in a lead shielded room. So if they can get over those two slight drawbacks, it'll be quite a bit better than EEG. Uh, and then of course, I've linked uh, on the online presentation to a bunch of videos. So that's.